Good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. David Sarwar. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Public Health, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our signature event for National Public Health Week uh, to kick off uh, uh, our scheduled events in advance of our Research and Evidence-Based Practice Day. Uh, it is my great, great honor and thrill uh, to introduce and to be able to host Dr. Thomas uh, Leviste, who is the Dean and Weatherhead Pre Presidential Chair in Health Equity at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Med Medicine. Uh, as a Tulane alum at the undergraduate level for some 30-something <clears throat> years ago, um, it's always great to, to welcome a, a fellow uh, Tulane, Tulanean to our community. We actually have about five on our faculty right now, and I think many of us are well aware that you know, Tulane and, and the uh, School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine is, is one of the country's leading institutions in addressing public health problems. And we're in for a special treat tonight because uh, Dean Levis is actually going to present his documentary to us called The Skin That You're In. And that after the screening of the video, you're going to have an opportunity through an extended question and answer session to ask Dr. Levis questions about the film and his work. Um, on these really, really important issues. And so just as a reminder, if you do have questions, please post them in the question and answer feature. But as a way of introducing the film, we know that African-Americans live sicker and die younger than any other ethnic group in the nation. Why is this happening? The Skin You're In explores the health inequalities that African-Americans are currently facing, including why it exists and what can be done about it. The film features leading experts and researchers from across the country, those experiencing the disparities firsthand, and people making a difference in their communities. The Skin You're In is, is not only a feature documentary, which we're pleased to see tonight, but there's also a companion website and book. And I think in some ways, these issues are not only timely, but timeless. So whether we're talking about issues of um, racial injustice in law enforcement, or we're talking about issues of disparities related to COVID and other chronic diseases in America, I cannot think of a better topic for us to end our formal programming for the week. So with that, please help me, please join me in welcoming Dean Leviste and our viewing of The Skin You're In. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here with you virtually and participate in um, National Public Health Week at uh, Temple University. Um, you know, I'm often asked, how is it that I became, came to be a filmmaker? What, how did this even happen? Believe me, I never set out to be a filmmaker. But I just wanted to give you a little background, a little context of how this happened. Um, what happened is that I was at dinner with a, a buddy of mine who is not in public health or even academia. And, you know, usually we, we talk about, I don't know, football or whatever, just uh, the kids, families, different topics, and don't really talk often about our work. And this night, though, this friend just kept insisting on asking questions about my work. What do I do? And, you know, what exactly does a professor do on a daily basis? You know, I know that you teach classes, but that's not 40 hours a week. What do you do? And usually when I'm asked questions like that, I have these, you know, quick snippy answers that I give and try to segue the conversation back to football or the kids or families or whatever. <laughs> and every one of my little dodges, they, they didn't work. He just kept insisting no but seriously what 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 is it what what do you do and so i said okay this he's he really wants to know so let me give him some kind of an answer and i said okay um i'm writing a book he says okay uh like well what what's the book about so i told him the book was about african american health that you know there's so much research that has been done on why we have these racial disparities and but that information is all locked away in the library and what i want to do is get it out of the library and write it in, uh, in in a way that the general public can understand not an academic book not for academia and get it out for the to the public so that people can benefit from all this information that's been accrued over the last few decades and uh, this friend of mine um, says well yeah that's a great idea but i don't think you want to make a write a book because you're not going to reach that population with a book what you need need is a film you need a documentary and my answer to him was well i know how to write a book i don't know how to make a film so i'm going to write a book and finally we changed the topic right <laughs> the next morning 
next morning I'm meeting with this is uh, this is all happening at that at that time I was at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health the next morning uh, I had a, an early morning meeting with the fundraising team and they were prepared they were prepping me to go up to uh, New York to meet with a, a donor and they asked me said well w what do you have or do you have anything you're working on that you think this donor would be interested in and I said I'm gonna make a film I'm gonna make a documentary now this idea was about eight hours old in my head I had no idea what was the first thing you do to make a film I knew nothing about it and 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 what she said to me was shocking she says well guess what the day that you're gonna be in New York that night there's a, a reception of um, with people from the film from people from Johns Hopkins in the film industry to which I responded, there are people from Johns Hopkins in the film industry? <laughs> of course, there are lots of people in the film industry, and we're going to, let me see if I can get you an invitation to the reception. So I say, okay, sure. So I show up at this reception. Of course, I don't know anyone. And I'm wearing a name, name tag. We're all wearing name tags. And people would walk up to me. They'd look at my name tag, and then they'd look me in the eye and pretend that they knew who I was. And then they would say, so what's your next project? Now, of course, for me, my next project would be my first project. Um, and <laughs> so I figured, okay, well, one in Rome, do as the Romans. And I just started walking around a reception and walking up to people and saying, so, David, what's your next project? So, Joan, what's your next project? And I started meeting all these filmmakers and um, developed this network of people that actually did know how to make a documentary film and they helped me so to this day they don't allow me to push any buttons or touch anything but um but they were very helpful and helped me to put together this documentary film the idea first was that this would be one film um one 90 minute documentary feature length documentary but then as we started shooting it just became clear that the topic was too big and there was too much to cover and what we needed was a series so now we've converted it from one film to a series and what I'm going to show you is the first episode that we've completed in the series. We're still working on the other episodes, but this is the first one that we've completed. And this episode is called um, Something About Brownsville. And I'll, um, I'll just play it for you. And then on the other end, we'll talk about it and see what you think. So that was, um, that was fantastic. I... Um... You know, I think for those of us who work in public health, so many of the themes are things that we talk about regularly. And I, I teach health psychology every semester and obviously very much appreciated the, the stress reaction and the fight and flight. And several of my students are, are also on. So I'm sure they think, oh, wow, at least he's teaching us things that other people like to talk about, too. Um, but, you know, I, I, I mean, I have so many different reactions and I'll just start with the, the top level one and I'll turn to some of the questions. I was so struck by how the two young men, the more you got them to talk, the more they shared with us, the more and 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 they revealed their insight of to uh, their awareness of what was going on at a level that we don't don't always hear in terms of why is the liquor store open at eight o'clock in the morning? Why aren't there fresh food markets, the social norms with the eye contact? But what what really resonated with me and, and I was the comment of the, the, the gentleman in the, in the satin Yankees jacket. There was a little too much, as a Cubs fan, there's a little too much Yankee paraphernalia in the whole thing, but that's a side issue. Um, how he talked about, you know, how he would not want his daughter to witness some of the things that he's witnessed, which is, you know, I think a reaction that any parent would have. We would never want our kids to see the worst of what we've had to witness. We hope that, you know, our kids have a better life and they don't see the negative things that we've seen. And I, I was just, I, I don't feel like I've seen a lot of depictions um, quite like that. So I thought that in particular, among many things, was just very, very striking and very powerful to me. Um, so, but, but thank you so very much for, for sharing this with us. Um, I, I think, you know, particularly where we are in North Philadelphia, given that, you know, the, the dynamics are not that different yep. than Brownsville is just really, really hits home to all of us and our students who go out and, and do field work placements in neighborhoods that are remarkably similar. 
Sure, sure. I'm, I mean, I think you, you picked up on a couple of uh, some of the most important themes of what we were trying to do. First is that I'm very familiar with North Philadelphia. And, you know, there's a Brownsville in every city in this country. And, yeah. you know, and so this story, it's about Brownsville, but it really isn't about Brownsville. I mean, we use Brownsville as a device to tell this story about, you know, me going back there and talking about basically social determinants of health and how these social factors get under the skin and affect health. And that's really what the film is about. Um, it's set in Brownsville. We use, you know, as a, a kind of a, a narrative device of me go, being from that neighborhood and being a public health researcher and going back there. But that's really what we're saying is that there's a Brownsville everywhere and people that live in these communities don't often get depicted in their full humanity. And that was part of what we wanted to do. You'll notice a lot of things we did very intentionally. We mm -hmm. shot the residents in Brownsville the same way that we shot the experts. Yeah. We lit them the same way. We framed them the same way. We shot them exactly the same. We treated them like everybody else because it's that common humanity that's often missed and it doesn't come out in the in the media. Mm -hmm. So you picked up on that when you know Tay Mack makes the comment about his daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know his the other one, Tyrak, is also a father. He's a single father raising his son by himself, and it, it didn't come out in the film. We didn't get into into that part of his life in the film, but there, there, you know, people that live in these communities that we 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 see on the news and we hear all the tragedies that are coming out of these neighborhoods, they are just humans like everybody else, and they yeah. may be living in an, in, in um, chaotic uh, circumstances, but there are human beings living in the chaotic circumstances, and their reactions, their responses are really no different than the other human being. One other thing I want to say about those guys is that they are the perfect depiction of something that I've said many times, which is that there is a difference between intelligence and education, and these two guys didn't have an opportunity to get a formal education. Right. But they are intelligent. They are as brilliant as any student that I've encountered at Johns Hopkins or Tulane or George Washington or any other university. They just didn't have the opportunity to develop that talent, that ability that they have. So they are very much aware of what's going on. They don't have the vocabulary to talk about social determinants of health and all this kind of stuff. But they understand all of those concepts and they speak very eloquently about it, which is why I let them just talk and um, that's why they make such an important part of what this film is, is um, showing. I agree. And I, I couldn't help but think as, um, you know, the, the one guy kept dropping F-bombs thinking, you know, our greatest fear, you know, in public speaking would be to accidentally drop one. <laughs> and, and, you know, he was using them and, and clearly there was no sense, you know, that this is, this is my life. This is how I view the world. And, I like, you know, whether for us, it's a function of our education or our training, you know, this is how I view things. And I'm not going to be filtered or sterilized in some way, just because I happen to be on camera. So I, I completely agree with you. So we do have a number of questions. And again, I have a, a bunch that, that I can ask you, but I'm developing this bad habit when I moderate of, of dominating the conversation. So I'm going to try not to do that. The first one is actually some kudos. So a member of our community uh, actually was an MPH student in the program at Hopkins 10 years ago and had a class with you and said, uh, she, she said, I'm so happy that you took the leap to make these documentaries and to bring this research to a more general public. Thank you for sharing it at this event. So, so um, you, you've got a, a former student in our audience who's now a member of, of, of our team. That's so. really nice to hear. It's, it's always good. I'm, I'm always afraid when I meet former students that they'll take out retribution against me. But um, I, I think I, I, I think I was not that difficult in class. Hopefully, this degree, I wasn't that bad of an instructor. Well, you know, getting getting back to just where you started the documentary with the yeah. difference in life expectancy. In my last class of the semester, so my students are going to hear this in two weeks. I illustrate that the life expectancy difference between North Philadelphia, where Temple is, and Society Hill, which is kind of one of the more older, you know, predominantly white neighborhoods is actually 14, it's, I'm sorry, it's actually 14 years, but it's only about an 18 block difference. And it's a straight shot going north and south. So essentially I, am, I tell them, I said, I want you to imagine that if you left campus and walked directly south for every block that you get closer to center city Philadelphia, your life expectancy goes up essentially one year. 
and that that very much I think speaks to the social determinants and mm -hmm. and what's going on in the neighborhood, whether it's the depletion of healthy resources or the lack of resources to deal with illness and appropriate treatments. And I always tell my students, if, if I bump into you years later and you remember something good from my class, that's one of the things I want you to remember, that this is about the social determinants of health and the neighborhoods that we may or may not be fortunate enough to live in. So, so one question that's come in is, what do you make of school options? So public schools, charter schools in different cities. There are more and more charter schools, there are more, cap, but at the same time, Catholic schools are dying. And some public schools have been assigned to universities to run. And it seems like these so-called choices for families are not really available for the poorest children in certain areas. Exactly. Do you think this is intentional? And should public health schools get engaged in these dialogues? As we know that education is a predictor of morbidity and mortality. Yeah, I think public health should be involved. Absolutely. I think that if we're going to address the, the health the issue of health inequalities, you know, the inequities in the society really cut across three, the three, three, four sectors where I see inequities that they cause each other and they're caused by each other. And we need to be dealing with all four of these inequities comprehensively. And I don't believe that we can solve any one of these problems unless we take a comprehensive approach to all four. And it's, of course, health inequities, of course, as we we're talking about here today, but there's also wealth inequities, mm -hmm. there is uh, educational attainment inequities, and final, finally there's criminal justice inequities, and by criminal justice, I'm talking about mass incarceration and over-aggressive policing. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how we fix any of those problems if we don't take a comprehensive view, because each one is causing the other. Mm -hmm. So yes, public health needs to be at the table along with every other sector, and we need to be talking about problems in society and writ large, and not assume that any one sector has the solutions to fix even their own problems, because I don't think they, I don't think any of them do. Mm -hmm. Now, the charter school issue, I think that here is, this is an issue of equity versus, you know, this is an issue of equity versus uh, equality, right? Mm -hmm. So education, I mean, I'm sorry, government has the ability to create equity. It has the ability to allocate resources, the ability to redistribute resources. That's what taxation is all about. We take taxes from people who have the ability to pay taxes, and then we create resources that everyone in society gets to benefit from. And I think by offloading the responsibility of public schools to um, outside of government, to other oh. entities such as charters, you know, for-profit companies in some cases, universities, I think that that's an abrogation of their responsibility. And what we really need to do as a society is value education and therefore be willing to be taxed sufficiently to fund education at the level that is required in each neighborhood. Neighborhoods that have more challenges require more funding and should be funded more. And as a society, we need to get to the point where we're willing to uh, buy into that. But I don't know how we do that if we don't have politicians that are willing to lead lead the society in that direction. And that's where I think we've been lacking certainly mm -hmm. over the last few decades. So so to, to make that question a little more specific, um, you know, as you probably know, on the heels of Katrina, Tulane kind of remade itself a little bit before your arrival. Right. Right. And, and obviously started doing more with community engagement and requiring the undergrads to do community service. And I have to be honest, I, I think in that period of time, um, I don't think I'd ever been more proud to be an alum than to see how they pivoted on the heels of Katrina. But as you and I both know, Tulane and, and the entire enterprise is one of, if not the largest employer in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So does the, do you feel like Tulane as a university or your school in particular bears some additional responsibility oh, of because course. of its presence in the city compared to Temple in Philadelphia, for example? Absolutely. We are the largest largest private employer in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, New Orleans is a poor city and we're in one of the poorest states. Right. And we have only one Fortune 500 company headquartered in the entire state. Mm -hmm. And that's the utility. They can't leave. Right. <laughs> So, you know, and then you consider even like specifically about my school, the School of Public Health. Yeah. We're located on Canal Street, right at the foot of the French Quarter. 
we we occupy very valuable real estate mm -hmm. that the, the city does not get to tax because we're a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. And I take that as an in-kind contribution that the city of New Orleans is making <laughs> to the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Yeah. And because of that, I feel that I have a responsibility, an obligation. I don't have the right not to be yeah. an asset for the city and for the state and for our region. Okay. Um, one interesting question related to more of the content of the documentary, were, were people reluctant in Brownsville to meet with you? Um, no, I was no? actually surprised. I mean, I, I, I moved, I moved away, um, when I went away to college and never mm -hmm. really, never really moved back after that. And, you know, I still have friends there. So I still had some engagement in and out of the community, but that was many years ago. And I had no idea how people was going to react to me, you know, when I decided to, to take on this project. But I was greeted um, very graciously. People welcomed me into their homes. As you can see, we took shots inside of people's houses. There's the one scene that we shot on the rooftop, one of the housing projects. You know, that those are not places where, you know, middle-aged guys with cameras typically get to hang out. And they fully embraced us and uh, opened their lives to us. And I, and I think it was that they they believed in what we were trying to do. They they viewed me and and the crew as people that were authentic and mm -hmm. not exploited exploitative, and who was trying to who was going to try to make a film that was going to make a difference and tell the story of that community in a way that's not exploitative. If you Google Brownsville, Brooklyn, you will get I don't know millions of hits, and it will be horror story after horror story. Mostly it will be newspaper reports about um, some tragedy that's happened there. And that is the narrative about that community. So if you're from Brownsville or if you know anything about Brownsville, you're accustomed to that narrative. Yeah. And the fact that we came in with cameras and they still was willing to let us come in and film, I think they, they just viewed me as just another kid from Brownsville that came back to, to visit home. And that's exactly the way I presented it. And the last thing I'll say about that, if you look at the film, this is a subtle thing, but this was a statement to the people of Brownsville. Um, two things. One was, if you notice in the beginning of the film, the, we show me on the subway coming into Brownsville and they see mm -hmm. me enter. We don't ever show me leaving. And that's intentional because I haven't left. I mean, I don't physically live there, but I'm yeah. still connected with that community now. And I expect at this point, I expect that I'll be uh, connected to that community for the, for the duration. That's one thing. The other thing, if you notice that we ended talking about that community assets, mm -hmm. the social capital in that community, yep. the sense of community and how in spite of all of the challenges and the deprivation that people in that community continue to fight to improve that community. And that was intentional because we needed that statement to be in there. We needed to make sure that that was reflected back to the community so that this film becomes a mirror for them. Mm -hmm. Did you, you know, I think when all of us go back to our hometowns, we're kind of struck and we see them differently in adult eyes. I know when I go back to, you know, visit that my childhood home, I'm struck by how the houses are much closer together than I imagined. Obviously, the trees have kind of grown over, um, but everything seems a little smaller. Um, were there, are there particular things that seem different about Brownsville today and the Brownsville that's in the documentary versus what you remember growing up there? Not really. I mean, what I remember, I mean, in, in the end, that, that monologue at the end, you know, I talk about how, you know, what I remember as a kid growing up, I mean, I remember all the, the, the media coverage and all the tragedies and they happened then too. But what I remembered was that that was all always a part of what it meant to live in that community. But there was this other side, this nurturing side. And I was nurtured there as a child growing up. Mm -hmm. That aspect of it, which you don't ever hear about in the media. And when I, when I went back, I found the same thing. The tragedies are still there. There are still problems. There are still gangs. There's still violence. All of that is still going mm -hmm. on. And we're not Pollyanna about that. But I did meet a lot of people that just embraced me and bought into what I was trying to do and did what they could to help. Yeah. So another question from the audience. Um, years ago, I read an article about the relationship of the epidemiology of HIV in cities that were then proposing planned shrinkage to redevelop certain neighborhoods by literally letting those neighborhoods burn out. So yeah. fire departments were reduced, rescue services were limited and so forth. 
I imagine that many people were dying of heart attacks and other conditions because emergency services were not accessible or took longer. Is that still happening in not only say Brownsville, but other neighborhoods that are comparable? Yeah, I, that's, that's a tough one for me to say. I, I, I really don't know. I do remember some of those resources were removed from Brownsville when I was coming up as a kid, you know, mm -hmm. police precinct, fire, both police and fire was removed. There's an elementary school that I was supposed to go to that was closed down and abandoned just a few weeks before I was supposed to start there as a kindergartner. Um, so yeah, that did happen. Um, at this point, Brooklyn is undergoing gentrification and is being totally remade. And the Brooklyn of today is very different than the Brooklyn I grew up in. Brownsville is the sole exception to that, where mm -hmm. gentrification really hasn't pierced Brownsville as much. Uh, in part because so much of the housing there is owned by the city. It's public housing. And so you don't have individual owners who can sell to individual buyers. And that's been part of the issue. Brownsville has always been the holding bin for uh, New York. It was developed back in the um, early 20th century when uh, they were redeveloping Manhattan and building projects like Lincoln Center. The people that lived in those tenement houses there were moved into Brownsville, and that was mm -hmm. how that settlement even started. Um, so when you already live in the city's holding bin, where did, where did they put you to gentrify? There's no way to put people. So right now, Brownsville still hasn't fully gone through the gentrification. I'm not sure if that's going to be possible with the preponderance of public housing, um, but but I don't know. But um, yeah. yeah. I also think the... the um the historical tour that you took us through in the beginning of, Brown, of the documentary about Brownsville and how the neighborhood has changed over time, I think was really instructive. I think a lot of times, you know, we tend to look at neighborhoods in terms of where they are now. And like you said, in terms of gentrification, where they can be. And we sometimes forget kind of what is their history and what was their role in the fabric of the city, whether it was 50 or 100 years ago. And I, I thought that was actually very instructive and and also when you start talking about redlining, I think for many of our students, that's a construct that, that may be less familiar to them. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of our students, the next couple of questions I think are related more towards issues around training and education in public health. So putting your Dean's hat on for a moment, mm -hmm. um, do you think that our public health training programs need to put more of an emphasis on advocacy and political action? And if yes, how do we do that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Full stop, yes. How do we do that? That's another question, but it should be done. I think that we need as, as much, I think public health needs to have as the loudest voice possible when it mm -hmm. comes to dealing with health issues. We see through this pandemic how that plays out. When science and politics come together, uh, science usually loses. Um, but you need strong voices uh, of, of people who are strong advocates and who can and who have the, um, the integrity to stick to the science mm -hmm. and to, um, to not shrink under the pressure. And you look at uh, my fellow Brooklynite, uh, mm -hmm. Tony Fauci, and as a good example of someone who stuck to the science in spite of tremendous pressure that he was under. And we see other people who I won't name, but other public health leaders that, uh, that did not stand up as strongly as he did. And we see CDC, for example, having been compromised and yeah. lost some of its credibility because of it. Yeah, I think I, you know, I didn't see the documentary that was on CNN a couple of weekends ago. It's been taped, but I haven't watched it yet. But I'm, I, I'm convinced that years from now, somebody is going to write an amazing book about how what really went on between public health and politics in the last year and a half around these issues yeah. and what we got wrong or what maybe not what we got wrong but how we were as you said you know when we go toe to toe with politics we often lose um and maybe there's lessons in there of what we need to do and can do to win the next fight like this um but you know i, I i'm 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 trying to be optimistic and thinking that 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 day will come and, and we'll learn lessons from that um you gotta be willing to quit your job you gotta be willing to quit and I, and I think there was, I think that was the problem at CDC. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. And 
And yet I, I know that personally, I will love to hear, or, or I can almost imagine how horrifying it will be to read about the, how this probably got personal and personal threat. I mean, we know that Fauci's, I mean, you know, even, even a couple of weeks ago when, um, you know, let's, let's dock his pay because he didn't do his job. I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> so so um, a, another educational related question. Um, in a course in our college called Race, Culture and Health, Many of our white students often get defensive while talking about issues around white privilege. Any suggestions about how to break through and have our students in a classroom setting have more productive conversations around white privilege? Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think these are uncomfortable conversations and by design, they're supposed to be uncomfortable conversations um, and you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. And that's part of growth, right? That's how that's how we grow. And so, I mean, you have to. I mean, what I would always do when I when I would when I was teaching, you know, I would always begin my course by talking about political correctness and you know the importance of tolerance, um, but being intolerant to um, intolerable behavior, right? So, and how we had to engage these topics intellectually because they are things that can be learned. And, uh, and I would always say you have to engage it intellectually and try to, get, try to take the emotion out as much as possible. Make any point you want to make as long as you can back it up with facts and, you know, reasonable, you know, reasoned, uh, and facts and reason. And that was the standard. So you can say that anything you wanted to say as long as you were not disrespectful to people and as long as you were able to back it up with facts and reason. Mm -hmm. That's that's the only way I know to engage the, these topics because these topics are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So a um, couple of last questions and, and we've got many comments in here that are gonna be on the, the theme related to the last question. So have you, are, are there plans to do a sequel to this that's focused more on New Orleans and the issues that are unique to them? I know you made reference to the fact that there's going to be a series. Uh, do you right. see some of this work becoming, I mean, you, I, your point is well taken that this, you could do this in any major city in America, but do you see yourself making this local at some point? No, I think it's a national project. You know, mm -hmm. this episode is, is, is based in Brooklyn and it's only because the story narrative is around me and my life and me having come from there. <laughs> um, the, the rest of the film, the rest of the series will be filmed in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. But it's really about themes. So this is about social determinants of health, right? Mm -hmm. Happens to be in Brooklyn. We are shooting, we are planning an episode that where New Orleans will be featured and that one will be about environmental justice. But it's a story about environmental justice, which could have occurred in any other city. Just happens that it's New Orleans because there's a lot of environmental justice issues here. And it's a, it's a great place to tell that story. And so we're just, that's the way we're approaching it, not in terms of, um, you know, featuring different cities, but it's it's uh, different themes that illustrate and explain why the disparities exist um, and trying to shoot it in as many different locations as we can. I, I appreciate you may not want to answer this next question because you might not want to give away the plot, but is the environmental justice going to tie back to Katrina and what happened post Katrina? Yes and no. It's not about Katrina specifically, okay. but it's about what happened with one of the development uh, projects um, that that came out of that, and how it basically led to a can cancer cluster. As interesting an example of environmental. Interesting. Justice. So as we get towards the bottom of the hour, the the most frequent question that's been posted is. Um, what is the status and the availability of the video yeah. and the and the related materials for educational purposes? Right. So we so where we are, as I said, we have the one episode where where we've we've entered it into film festivals. It's been accepted to a, a, a quite um, pleased with the number of film festivals that has, have accepted it. Congratulations. And, <laughs> and thank you. And we're trying to uh, raise money to finish the series. So at this point, we're showing this one episode to help to try to create some interest and buzz to help us with fundraising. But um, we, we, we're 
trying to be very careful not to let the film fall into um, the public domain so it doesn't show up on YouTube or something sure. because we want to release it as a full series. And the series would inc will include educational materials for, uh, for use in colleges and high schools. Okay. So if, if anyone's interested, you can follow us in social media. We're on all the major social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. Um, if you follow us, you know, and we have the website as well, which is T-S-Y-I, the skin you're in, the initials, T-S-Y-I dot O-R-G. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you, and you can you can get updated on kind of where, where the process is. Yeah, Lu Luisa just also posted the uh, your website in the chat, so people can get that as well, which, which I think is great. So yeah, I, I can appreciate that as as phenomenal as the video is, and as much as I would love it in my own health psychology class, I'll have to be patient and wait until the series is done. So, um, so last last uh, question: any words of wisdom? for our students at Temple, and you've got a mix of undergraduate and, and PA, or MPH as well as some PhD students in the audience today. Um, words of wisdom as they look to launch their careers, but kind of keeping this issue of social determinants of health and the themes of the documentary in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, you know, I, I, I found my, I, I meandered my way into public health, like most people do, you know, <laughs> through a circuitous route. And it was, and, and what, what led me there is when I developed a passion about something that I found out. I found out that race disparities existed. I didn't know this was an issue. I was literally in graduate school when I learned that this was a problem. Mm -hmm. And I just became fascinated by it. And it really just changed my direction. And I've been focused on that topic ever since. So my advice uh, is to whatever that thing is that, that fuel that passion in you that made you want to go into public health in the first place, don't lose sight of that. That is the, that is the fire. That's the fuel that, that will propel you to, um, to seek answers and to do the work that's necessary and to learn whatever you need to learn to do to be able to move that agenda forward. Even if it means learning how to become a filmmaker, you will do whatever you gotta <laughs> do because it's something you care that much about. So find that passion and don't, don't get uh, diverted um, by other topics. Well, I think that's a phenomenal note to end on, Dean Levice, and, and I, I really, really do appreciate you taking the time and energy to join us during National Public Health Week to share the video with, with us. Again, I you know have a list of about 12 questions and comments that I jotted down. I think we covered one of them, but congratulations on just what I think is, tells a great story that obviously many of us are familiar with, but so many people are not. And so to get those messages out to the largest audience, whether it's other public health students, you know, I can almost see the value in this when you start showing it to, you know, high school juniors and seniors who are thinking, what do I want to major in? What do I want to study? You know, it's an issue we deal with at Temple a lot. I'm sure you you all do as well. You know, how do we get people engaged in issues around public health and explore it as a profession? Um, but it's been an absolute treat to, to learn from your wisdom, to see the video. Um, and to meet you. So on behalf of our entire community, thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, and hopefully, you know, good luck, obviously, with your upcoming graduation in person. We're trying to do the same thing. We'll see what happens. Uh, but hopefully you and I will have a chance to meet together in person sometime sooner rather than later. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Great. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. <laughs>